Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Dean's Lecture Series at Carnegie Mellon University in Qatar. I'm Michael Trick. I'm the Dean at uh, CMUQ, and it is my pleasure to have you all here today. So today, it is my honor to introduce Adrian Wood, the Chief Executive Officer of Siemens Cutter. Now, as many of you know, Siemens Cutter is a longtime friend of CMUQ, and many of our alumni have pursued careers there. This year, Siemens will be sponsoring this year's hackathon competition, and they've been an invaluable source of information and guidance to the CMUQ Consulting Club. We are thrilled that Adrian Wood is with us today to share his expertise. Mr. Wood studied computer science at Coventry University and joined Siemens Environmental Systems in 1984 as a marketing analyst. Over the years, his career has taken him through many functional areas of Siemens business, including sales, marketing, business development, project management, and now, of course, general management. Mr. Wood has an extensive knowledge of the Gulf region and has served as CEO for Siemens Kuwait, Siemens Bahrain, and head of renewable energy for the MENA region. He was appointed CEO of Siemens Qatar in 2016. Today, Mr. Wood will be speaking to us about the role of Siemens in supporting economic prosperity in Qatar. So before I invite him to the podium, uh, just uh, 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 I'd like to take, take a moment to greet the members of the media. Uh, thank you for coming. We really appreciate you coming and uh, being part of this event. As you know, we reserve our Q&A portion of the presentation for members of our academic community. If you'd like to ask specific questions of our guests, please wait until we break for refreshments. And now, would everybody please join me in welcoming Adrian Wood to the Dean's Lecture Series. Good afternoon, all. Can you hear me at the back? Right, it's a privilege to be here to talk on behalf of Siemens. And the question I want to address today is how is Siemens supporting the prosperity or the development of Qatar? And I'm going to address that really from a technological, from a technical point of view, and a little bit of a digitalization chucked in. I will look at a bit of yesterday, a little bit of today, but I'll concentrate more on tomorrow, what we're doing in Siemens, and how does it really support the development of Qatar? I want to ask a question to kick this off from the audience. What do you think Siemens actually does? Please don't say mobile phones. What do we do? Anybody? No, oh, not bad. Someone's reading the profile. What else do we do? Whoa, that's very good. And now from the back, because they keep quiet at the back. Sorry? Okay. Fine. Okay. I'll live with that. And I'll come back to that question later on. I've been with Siemens now approximately 30, 35 years. I've been with the Siemens group of companies, so I've seen how Siemens has developed with their technology. And I can remember just prior to starting with Siemens, I used the technology. Has anybody heard of ticker tape? Who are the computer scientists here? Come on, hands up. Computer scientists? One, two, three. Have you heard of ticker tape? No. Wow. Well, somebody's heard of it. Prior to floppy disks, thumb drives, hard disks, punch cards, you had to program computers with ticker tape. Bits of tape where you punched holes and you programmed the actual computers. There was no keyboards. I was the first student in our school to do that examination on the course computer science, and we used ticker tape. Now, some 20, 30 years later, Siemens is looking at a lot of cloud-based IoT applications, edge computing. What a change. And not just the market, but this is what Siemens is actually doing in Siemens to bring to the market. So, very interesting changes. I've been in the Middle East roughly 20 years. Various countries, some I shouldn't mention due to the blockade, <coughs> UAE, <coughs> keep that quiet, Qatar, Bahrain, those countries. And I was talking to the colleague here. I used to come and work with a company called QGPC. 
Anybody know that company? Ah, they're the guys who have been here for a few years. That's the old name for QP. In those days, there was no West Bay. Zero. Just the two hotels, Sheraton and Marriott. Now it's a bit more. So, as you've probably worked out, I have a computer science background. I'm proud of that. It allows me to look at the technology, which gets me really exciting. And it's that, together with Siemens, what we can do for Qatar, bring the new technology. So, based on this, I feel I have some experience that I can talk to you today about what are we doing in Siemens to support Qatar. Now, we feel the key is technology. We feel the key is digitalization. If you look at the Qatar 2030 master plan, also Qatar feels that is the key. Qatar is very ambitious and so is Siemens. So I want to just talk through this morning, what are we doing in Siemens to support Qatar reach these goals? One of the key things we strive to do as a company, and I'll come back to it a number of times, is bring value for customers, employees, and society. Statistics have shown you can be reasonably successful if you just bring value to a customer. Similar if you bring it to customer and employees. But to be really successful, you must address all three. And you'll see time and time again that Siemens, that's both Siemens Qatar and Siemens Global, address all three. We are an engineering company, and you'll feel it again and again. We like to develop new technology. We like to bring that into the countries, such as Qatar. And a few things you'll see later on is things we're developing. You said smart grids. Very good. That is today and tomorrow's technology. It's got You haven't got Siemens technology, it's a bit faulty here. <laughs> if it breaks, it's G, definitely. <laughs> Siemens in Qatar. How old is CMU? You will definitely know, so I'm not even going to ask that one. No. How old is CMU? Oh, I'm impressed. Exactly correct, 119. Then I'll ask you a second question. How old is Siemens? More or less, do you think? Anybody? More or less than 119 years? <coughs> 200. Whoa. <coughs> 200 years. OK. Any other offers? No other offers. Well, actually, in fact, the gentleman is quite close. 172 this October. So CMU is just a little baby compared. But if you, if you talk to Standard & Poor, who come out with a lot of statistics, the average life of a company now is 18 years. So congratulations, CMU. And it also shows that Siemens is doing something right, if we can beat that average. And we are continually looking for technology. So it shows that this must be the way to go, or we're doing something correct. We have been in Qatar 172 years, but we have been in Qatar for a number of years, as you can see on the graph behind me. One of the first power stations, yes, we do power, was built by Siemens. You can also see that in 1982, I think it is, that one's the wrong way. 92, sorry, we worked with Motorola to give the first radio network. So theoretically, I could claim to be a pioneer for 5G. Now, Redo might not like that statement, but sorry, I've said it now, so it is what it is. But we've had a long history in Qatar. It's all technology-based. The last thing you'll see, believe it or not, is an agreement with QEWC, a training agreement. Why is this special? I mentioned to you customers, employees, society. This is a training agreement where we did not define the training. 
Why is that? This is for Qatari engineers. We do not want to take them into classrooms. You learn there, but you need real experience by witnessing what's happening with the turbine, what's happening on site, what's happening in the factory. Why is that important? Because if it breaks down, maybe Siemens get a call out order, we get money. No. In today's world, you have long maintenance contracts. If we train the Qatari engineers to operate the turbines, the transformers, much better. We have a much easier life. It's good for us, it's good for the equipment, it's good reputation. So it's in our interest as well to knowledge transfer. And Qatar is going towards a knowledge-based economy. We're proud of that. And this is a clear example of how we're trying to get knowledge into Qatar. Employees. Very, very important. Company is quite big, 340, 350,000 employees around the world. Here in Qatar, about 540. Over 50% are graduates, postgraduates. Why? We are an engineering company. That's what we need. In fact, <clears throat> one of our employees came from CMU, and she's in Sarah's team. So we do a lot of local hiring. <clears throat> Internships. <clears throat> Excuse me. We did a quick calculation. The last few years, 14,000 hours of internships from local universities. Again, that's knowledge transfer. We do it for customers as well. We do over 15,000 hours just transferring knowledge. So it's very important to get the training across. It's good for us long term. And you see what's happening in the world, what the technologies are coming. Very, very important. We do have quite a strong program with QF. It's a management program, and we take QF graduates, undergraduates, and we train them in Siemens. And in fact, over 10 of them have joined the Siemens Global Graduate Program. Doesn't mean they work in Qatar, they can work anywhere in the Siemens world. And number of locations, we're often asked about this, we have more Siemens locations than the UN over 200. So if you get into that program, there's quite a few locations you could get to. The Siemens company is really based around a number of key divisions. Power on gas. Now you could say, well, this is just lumps of rotating metal. It's pretty boring. And I know we've got computer science and engineers in this room. We look at the picture very, very carefully. Those blades. They're subject to heat up to 1,500 degrees C, almost the melting point of iron. So you have to use special alloys. Whoa, it's pretty intense. The G-force inside these turbines, if you go on a, a normal ride, you may get to 4 or 5 G if you go on, a, on these rides. The G-force is there, go up to 10,000 G. So you need very special alloys. And the aerodynamics of a turbine are far in excess of that of an F1 car. So if you really like to play around with the aerodynamics and alloys, that's the division you should go to. So where are these turbines? Well, actually, they're installed in Qatar. The thousandth turbine, and you might have seen this in the papers, the thousandth turbine from Berlin is installed in Umohu power station. And we're very proud because there's a thousand from our factory. But the technology, the latest technology, is brought into Qatar. And we're always trying to push that boundary. Combined cycle, you might get 63% efficiency. If we can get to 64, that's amazing savings. Amazing savings. So we do a lot in the power generation, and we do a lot in the oil and gas the compressors, the drives, the motors, the dolphin teams. Energy management, smart grids. We do a lot with Karama. Traditionally, you had a big power station. It chucked out the power through the transmission distribution to the home. That's changing. Nowadays, when you have photovoltaic cells, either on buildings, or on homes, 
where you have your electric car charging, it's possible to recharge. I put it back on the grid. You are now having what's called prosumers, producers, consumers. That is causing power to go in both directions. The moment that happens, you need a smart grid. That's coming. So we're working with Karama on how they take their traditional grid to a smart grid. The moment you put renewables on a grid, you don't have a clear, easy base load, like a gas turbine which just runs. And most people think, oh, okay, renewables quite steady. Wrong. Almost every single one is not predictable. Yes, in the Middle East, you can more or less predict the sun. But here's a question for you, because we're into biology here. What is the most predictable renewable energy? Anybody? The most predictable? Sunlight? Clouds? Can we predict the clouds? No. So, no. Hydro is not too bad. You're very, very close. Oh, very, very close. Waves really are, are not predictable due to weather, so it is, but it isn't. Right. Tidal. Tides you can predict almost to the minute. Wind power you can't predict. Solar you can, but not really in case it's clouds or it's not so sunny or you get a sandstorm. But tidal you can. So what you see, when you have majority of renewables, which is solar and wind, they are unpredictable at times, which means you need a smart grid. How do you handle the fluctuating power? Same as Qatar. Qatar is bringing in two times 350 meg renewable energy plants. They will put it on the grid. How do you handle 700 meg? It can be there, it can be gone. You've got to handle that. You need a grid to handle that. That's what's required. Building technologies. We've equipped over 200 buildings in Qatar with building management systems, control systems, security systems. But the biggest area is energy savings. Buildings are one of the most inefficient, let's say, energy users you can get. They use most of the energy of a, of a city and you can actually save typically up to 30%. Real example, yesterday I was part of a presentation to a well-known, let's call it hotel complex. I don't give the name, that won't be fair, it's NDAs. And they got a relatively new system. And we came in, we analyzed the whole lot. And we said to him, you can optimize on your chiller plant optimization. No, I can't. Yes, you can. Because it's just supplied. It's not optimized for the requirements. It's not optimized for the building. And it's not run as good as it could be. We can save between 16 and 20% on his fuel bill. Real bottom line. Not possible. We said, yes, we know your fuel bill. Here it is. And we will guarantee it. Straight off. Secondly, what's more important, the savings were equivalent to the CO2 emissions of 273 cars. Now, while that's not monetary value, he was just as excited because he gets targets now. And the companies we talk to have to save on emissions. And so you get monetary savings and you get CO2 savings. So we do a lot in this area. And we bring in a lot of, let's say, technology. It's all based on algorithms and AI. There's an application called Comfy from Siemens. And you can run it. And it gives you an indication of your building efficiency, room efficiency, and what you can do. It's a, it's a bot, more or less. It's a business bot called BizBot. Now you think, wow, is that new? Well, yes and no. There are a lot of bots. If you use um, Wikipedia, and most people Google Wikipedia, in the background, there's over 1,900 text bots just running on Wikipedia alone. 
just checking what's being put in and correcting it. Gardner actually, Gardner is a research group, they issued a report a couple of years ago, and they stated that by 2020, the average person will have more conversations with a chatbot than their spouse. I won't comment, I've been told not that one, <laughs> but it's an interesting fact if it's true. And if you look behind the technology, it's all coming. It's all coming. Mobility. There is a picture of a tram, so let's just get to this one. This is actually the QF tram, which we are designing and implementing. But I'm not going to concentrate on the tram, I'm concentrating on mobility. There is so much behind digitalization in mobility. It's enormous. And there's so much that Qatar can actually do in terms of improving mobility. Let's give you one statistic. There's a lot of drive towards autonomous cars, autonomous driving. And yes, we're trying to bring that here to Qatar. Why? Ah, it's a sexy thing, it's good, it's the way to go. There are typically one, just under 1.3 million deaths a year due to road accidents, and approximately 50 million injuries which have to go to hospital. Of that, 95% of those are caused by human error. So if you brought in autonomous driving, and you just managed to cut that down by 10, 20%, that's effectively 10 million hospital visits avoided. And the cost of that is phenomenal. That's just the savings on those figures. Can you do it here in Qatar? Yes. Siemens works on what's called V2X, vehicle to roadside vehicle to traffic lights. The next step is getting a lot of data communication from the vehicle to the roadside, roadside to the vehicle. The step after that is then vehicle to vehicle autonomous. And we're trying to look how we can bring that into Qatar under a controlled environment. But that technology and that development is being undertaken by Siemens because it's a lot of mobility data crunching. So you've got the data side, and you've got the mobility awareness. What else can you do? And Sarah mentioned that a few days ago. Melbourne and I think Los Angeles have got apps now running whereby if you step out your home and you want to go to your office, for example, you can plug in office and it will tell you which is the best way to go. Car, bike, probably not applicable, train, metro, taxi, bus. It tells you the quickest and probably the most cheapest. Wow. That's not available here, but it could be. You just need to bring the data together on a platform. You need to have good technology in terms of communication, which is like a 5G, which we've got, and you can do it. That's a very interesting app. London has a parking system whereby it tells you where the street parking is available. And they've now calculated they've saved 30% on time it takes to park your car. Okay, for the driver, it's pretty good. But if you think about the emissions you've saved, because parking is start, stop, start, stop, start, stop, that's a lot of emissions. Just by having an active system telling the car where to go. So what else can we do in Qatar? Well, you drive along these roads, and all of a sudden, ambulance wants to go by, or a VAP wants to go by, or you suddenly come up upon a, a building site where there's a sign about one meter ahead of the bollard, and boom, you break. Nowadays, the car can be told there is an ambulance coming 50 meters back, be aware. There is now a change in the diversion of some maintenance. This is real time. This adds security on the roads. This is technology you can bring into Qatar, which Siemens is working on. Factories, industry, 
very, very simple. This is also where digitalization is heading. We have a product called the Digital Twin. Now, I'm not going into biology. This is, again, technology. We work with Maserati, and they developed the Ghibli, which is their sports car, 100% in the digital world. They tested it, they prototyped it in the digital world without building one single panel. Everything. It cut down approximately 60% of their production time. This is getting the data, getting the algorithms, and learning from it. Is this new technology? This is today's technology. And this was designed by Siemens. Now, AI is very important. And in fact, Carnegie Mellon had a, a nice app. I hope you know about it. Whereby a few years ago, you produced an AI app or an AI algorithm which predicted heart attacks four hours earlier than the heart attack occurred. That's pretty impressive. And it had an 80% accuracy. So that's quite impressive. We also, here in QSTP, developed a similar-ish algorithm. We found that a lot of top-level sports persons, both men and ladies, they got heart attacks. And they were in top physical condition. And the question was, why? So using the medical x-ray images and analyzing the data, we looked at the wall sizing of the heart. And you could predict, based upon that, what was the likelihood of a heart attack. And it became very, very accurate. And we now sell it around the world. And it's made in Qatar. We did it here at QSTP. So this is taking AI algorithms and advanced data, crunching it and using it. And the trick is taking raw data and making it information. With information, you can then make decisions. You can use it. But you can't use raw data. There's too much of it. You've got to make it into information. So when you go into factories, this is what they want. How do I save money? There's many things they can do. They just don't know what to do with their data. So a few things we've done here in Qatar, which is helping the development of Qatar itself. Let's dig into a couple. Oh, my hall. Big power station, great. What's so special? It does have the latest technology, latest control systems. They are protected against cybersecurity hacks. I'm, I've been outside and seen you've had another couple of speeches on cybersecurity. Very important these days. It produces a lot of the water and electricity needed for Qatar. It is fully integrated onto the grid. Now you've got to manage that power. That comes down to Karama, talking to QWC, talking with QP. We have gas and we have power. You have to match the two in the digital world. You don't want too much of either. You want to match the two. Because you can't suddenly export more. It's not possible. You can't suddenly use more power. What do you do with it? OK, you can turn the turbines down. Sorry. The inefficiency goes really down now. You don't want to do that. So you want to use the power effectively. So you bring in some renewables, because the renewables can be 10 meg, 50 meg. That power station is 2.5 gigawatts. But if you're trying to manage all this, you need a smart grid. And a smart grid will start to work out what power do I use? Can I turn off a complete turbine? Can I use more renewable? Can I peak shave? It's possible. This is what we're trying to bring into Qatar. How to now manage these requirements from power. 60% of the power of Qatar is transmitted and distributed by Siemens. Also here. So if you annoy us, I'll flip a switch and you'll be in darkness. So be careful. 60%. We're now looking, how do they take that network to tomorrow's network? Very, very important. 
because as I mentioned, you're heading toward the prosumer model. And you've got to accept that is tomorrow's market. Does anybody not know about the e-car charging? Anybody? Okay. I'm assuming everybody's heard about it. Yes? Great. Everybody says, oh, e-car charging chargers. It's not the chargers. They are just normal chargers. What is behind this network? Because if you're bringing e-car chargers, you'll bring in e-cars. To bring in e-cars, you need the infrastructure around it. You need the billing models. Siemens is working on the billing models. How do you bill? You bill now through your telephone. You bill now through applications on your mobile phone. <coughs> We're working on that. But then you drive off to the Mall of Qatar. You want to know that it's free. You want to get there as a car park there. You think, oh dear, I'm in trouble now. I'll push my car back. So you have location monitoring again on your phone, and it tells the car. Then when you get there, the question is, how much do you want to top up? It's not just plug in and play. Why? You might not need a full, full tank of, let's call it power. You might not a little bit. But in the network itself, if you are in the middle of the day, and don't forget, in a, in a network, there's always two or three peaks throughout the day we need power. It depends on country to country. So the network might say, well, hang on a minute, I'm going to slow down the charging because I want the power to send somewhere else. So that means the smart network will talk to the charging units to slow them down slightly so you can optimize the network in the whole of Qatar. That's smart grid going one step further, and it's talking to the network for this e-car chargers. That's what's behind e-car chargers. Then you want to track what's happening. And in today's world, you need to know what's happening in your marketplace. And I think it was New York. They introduced a bicycle. They put a load of bicycles out. And then somebody asked, where do the bicycles go? Where do the people go? Because if we know where they go, we can then change either the routes, or we can then look at the districts they go for the coffee, the miles, whatever. And they realized they didn't know where people went. So they couldn't control. They later went on RFID tagging, and they mapped everywhere where people went on the bikes, and then they changed the location of the bikes, and they informed the shops, etc., what the trend was, where people went. So it's using raw data as a benefit of the country. Now, we won't have bikes here yet. Maybe QF will go that way. <clears throat> but if you tag people movement, car movement, you can do a lot of trending, a lot of trending. Trending means data goes information, and then you can make decisions. World Cup, <clears throat> small event coming in 2022. A couple of footballs being knocked around. That's a bit bigger than that. We are heavily involved in this. Siemens have done over 140 major events, from just bringing a bit of security, up to a complete airport terminal. Yes, you can get a temporary airport terminal. Everything is shipped in by Siemens, built, after the event, taken away again. So it depends what you want. And for 2022, we're doing a lot of the power requirements. We are now in seven of the eight stadiums. The ninth, let's see if it comes or not. So we do a lot of optimization of power. What is the requirement from SC? High availability. They're expecting 99.99. .99. Can we do that? Yes. By modern designs, and make sure you have redundancy in your networks, you can do that. So we need engineers who can look at, again, at the grid structure, the best way to handle the power, the best way for redundancy, as well as making sure your substation is very, very efficient. So again, it's very high technology. I've got a couple of slides for the future. Question again to the audience. What would you say is the number one challenge affecting Qatar in its development? 
Don't all shout at once. I'll try this one at a time. What do you think the number one challenge is? What do you think? Human capital traffic. Okay, yes. Anybody else? Come on, don't be shy. Those at the back, they always try and hide at the back. Risk management. Okay, so we had human knowledge, human capital, traffic, and risk management. Well, we, Siemens, feel it comes down to sort of four areas. Digitalization is very key, it's the technology. Knowledge is very important. Because no matter what you've got, you need knowledge to drive those assets. Technology is no good unless you actually have the knowledge previously. Now, there's a small caveat to that. We are in the Industrial Revolution 4.0. They call it 4.0. Cities 4.0. Farming 4.0. What actually is digitalization? And those from computer science will know that we were digital some 20, 30, 40 years ago. So it's not going digital. It really is going from descriptive to prescriptive. What do I mean by that? Descriptive is, oh, what happened? Okay. Moving to, okay, why did it happen? Moving to what will happen? to eventually moving to what should I do to stop what didn't happen happening. If you can get to prescriptive, you're getting towards a predictive nature. And you've heard about predictive maintenance. It's predicting what will happen. Once you can start to do predictive maintenance, the next thing is predictive operations. That's where we're heading. That is where efficiency gains are. You can only do that if you have enough data. But data on its own is not good enough. You need to take the raw data and again make it into information. You need a platform. You then need to analyze it. You then put the AI algorithms. So you've got to get from descriptive to prescriptive, predicting what's going to happen. Is that far off? No. Because that's where autonomous driving is going. They are looking ahead at what could happen. We hear about drones. And there was a report that Dubai will be flying passengers in drones by 2017. Nah, that didn't happen. But there's a lot of AI applications out there. There's a lot of virtual reality. I think if you now go to Bentley, you can actually get given a VR headset and you can see the new car. Now, if you take that one step further, and you actually record the sounds of the car, and you think that's a bit weird, but if you went to the exhibition, the Porsche exhibition, which, is, which was, sorry, by the building by the Islamic Museum, Porsche the exhibition there, they recorded a hundred sounds of a Porsche 911. The door clicking the engine sound, the start, everything they recorded. I don't know why, but they did it. So if you take that with VR, and you take a proper seat from, from the new car, and sit the person in it, you could run the whole new car without even developing it. To say, do you like it, do you not like it? The sound, the feel, everything. That's possible. Is Siemens doing it? Not for cars. No, but we are using VR. We're developing VR solutions for service and maintenance. In many cases, we can't get engineers onto the platform, onto location. So the guy there has a VR headset, and it sends back the images to Siemens, and we send back by VR either AI plans or real plans, or we analyze the pictures. So in Siemens, we're even using VR applications, oil and gas. So it's not just power stations, it's way beyond that. Mindsphere. Has anybody heard of Mindsphere? Please say yes. Please. Come on, techies. Anybody? 
Oh, my day's made. At least one's heard of it. Well done. I'll even give you one for free if I had one. It is an IoT-based cloud platform. If you go into industry, there is exons worth of data. What do you do with it? You've got to get the data. And it consists of various types of data on various platforms and various systems. That doesn't help you. You need a common industrial platform where you can put the data and then you can analyze it. You analyze it, the client analyzes it, university students can analyze it. Industrial platform. This is it. This connects systems together onto a common, it's not a Google platform, but it's equivalent to like a Google platform to allow industries to analyze data. You could take a stadium and you could put a lot of the data coming from a stadium, crowds, energy usage, images, and you could look at the efficiency of that stadium. You could then compare that stadium with a second stadium in Qatar. Why is the first stadium not as efficient? But then you could say, well, hang on, I'll compare it to another stadium in another country. With football, so why not look at the Allianz Arena? Look at its crowd control statistics. Look at its power requirements. Do they differ? Which one's better? So you can start analyzing the data. This is an open platform. It's generated even by Siemens, but it's a platform for anybody to use. So you could actually get a license tomorrow, go on there, get some data, either the data from CMU or data from somewhere else, and start AI algorithms and start crunching the data and come up with some interesting results. Once you do that, you can look at efficiency gains. You can compare data. That's the beauty of it. That's from Siemens, an IoT cloud-based platform. There was G and Siemens competing. They had Predix, we had Mindsphere, but G has dropped out the race because they all carved up a few businesses. And now this is the becoming the industrial standard. I want to end on smart city. City 4.0. There's many things you could do here in Do Doha, which we're doing around the world. Taking data and improving the security. You're improving the mobility. Retail. Retail has gone through a massive change. But 95, or it's actually 90% of people will take recommendations from other social media users compared to 23% who rely on advertising. So the whole emphasis is going around towards using social media to buy. And we know that. But once you can track what's being bought and who's buying it, you can do a lot more. That's data processing. That's digitalization. So you can do a lot with a city. Some cities are actually planning their cities in 3D. So then they can optimize what to put where and what data. You could bring that to Lucille. Lucille is a developing, call it mini city. And you can map how do I develop the city. Not just the roads, but the data infrastructure. Chicago, for example, has data points that are in the whole city. And all the data, travel data, people data, traffic data, is put on a central platform for anybody to access. And people go on and start looking at what they can do, what are the issues, what can they make more efficient. Minds would help there, and that's how you make your city much more efficient. So there's many things you can do in cities, city 4.0. Siemens has a lot of different applications, all technology driven, to help out in developing the city. This is where we're going. Cars are talking to people, mobile phones. Mobile phones are talking to traffic lights. Traffic lights are talking to buildings. It's all about data transfer. Once you have the data, you can do a hell of a lot with it to improve the city, to improve retail and buying. Companies like Siemens are behind the technology. You won't see us there because that's the actual end result, but we are heavily involved in this. Now, on one side is city 4.0, you can go to farming 4.0. Farming, well, why would Siemens bother with checking on tomatoes? 
Well, big greenhouses, and Kat wants to go food independent, ideally. A greenhouse wants ideal growing conditions for its vegetables. A stadium wants ideal growing conditions for its grass. Both do not want fungi or mildew. So we actually have an application designed by Siemens for the Munich Allianz Arena, where we monitor and control a number of variables to ensure the grass is green. Simple as that, green grass. Temperature, water, heating, lighting, wind, fertilizer, it's all data, monitored real time with an algorithm. You can take the same thing for a stadium to a greenhouse. It's all about data. So, Siemens is very present in Qatar. It's present around the world. It's driving technology and digitalization to try and support the development of countries, including Qatar. We have a very close relationship with QF and with CMU, and we are always looking to become a trusted partner, not just a supplier, but a trusted partner, so we can bring the technology into the country to support the country. So to finalize, I asked you right at the beginning, what did Siemens do? Power stations, smart grid. Hopefully you've seen a little bit more that we do and how we're trying to bring technology and digitalization into the market, into Qatar, to support the development. Thank you. Well, we have time for a couple of questions. And just a reminder at the beginning of the lecture, it's a relatively short utterance followed by a question mark. So please, <laughs> any questions? Well, one question uh, in relation to mine speed. Um, you collect the engineering data at the um, at the, uh, uh, the uh, fields, uh, are you into collecting uh, computer vision in terms of what's going on in terms of the play on the field? So more of the sports analytics side of the fence. It depends what you actually want to do with it. Mindsfree itself is just a platform. Mm -hmm. It allows people to get the data. Now, if you put your visual data on Mindsphere, somebody else could say, well, I'll put my visual data and I'll produce an app and you could use that app or algorithm, or vice versa. So Mindsphere allows you to access that data. It allows somebody else to access that data. Or when you put your data on Mindsphere, perhaps the actual algorithm already exists. And you think, well, I want to analyze some, some video images. Well, if it's already done, you can use it from somebody else. And we're finding more and more that a lot of algorithms and AI software exists just the data is not there to be used. And if you think about an industry application, how do I make my power more efficient? So many companies are asking the same question. So once you do it once, you can look at other people's data. Now, specifically answer your question, we don't necessarily analyze data, but AI is going that way. And there's an interesting report out, Google have got an app an AI algorithm, which looks at human beings and lip reading. And it looked at 5,000 hours of television. And after that, it could predict what the person was saying, 34% more efficient than a professional lip reader. So the technology there is to read images. You just got to get the data available, and then you compare it. It's very much coming today. Mindsphere is the platform to allow you to do it. Large companies such as Siemens and others that you mentioned are actively involved in this data acquisition, but there's a burgeoning concern out there about a personal information security. And I just wonder if you could share how do companies such as yours think about uh, personal security of information and people uh, not necessarily wanting uh, all of these technologies to uh, capture everything that they do. Very, very relevant. These days, your personal data can be used for a lot of stuff. 
not actually good, but it can be. So within Siemens, we are extremely careful and we follow the international, let's say, guidelines on using personal data. On a business front, most of the data we access is industrial data. So we don't actually get involved in personal data. That's up between the application user and the individual. And there, there must be full consent. In the Siemens world, we do not use personal data unless the employee is agreed. We do not pass around CVs unless the person is given written consent. We don't ever access personal data. That's very strict. But in terms of my presentation, you're looking at sensor data, travel data, car data, all that data. That tends to be business data and communication data. So it's not really affected by personal confidentiality. But Siemens is very, very strict. It will not ever do it. Other questions? If not, then let us thank Adrian again. We have a small gift for you. Oh. Uh, if we'd like to come over here, we can do this in front. There we go. And so if we can give this to you, get a couple pictures. Good. Thank you. So Thank you very much. much. Wonderful. It's very nice. I appreciate it. I wish you all the best. I think digitization technology is the way to go. I'm biased, obviously, because I'm Siemens, but it's got a good future. I thank you for the presentation. I'd love to come back maybe in a year's time and see what we're doing on MindSphere, how it's moved on, but I wish you all the best. Good. Thank, thank you very you much. So much.